Praise the Lord. Before we hear the preach of God's word today, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, in thee, O God, do we praise thy word. In thee, O Lord, do we praise thy word. For thou hast magnified thy word above all of thy name. And we pray, O God, to be founded upon a rock, hearing these things of thine and doing them. Pray in us even sanctify and cleanse us through the washing and the water of thy word, that thou mayst even present us to thyself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle in any such thing, to be holy and without blemish. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us return our Bibles again to the book of Mark, chapter 16, verse 15, returning to what is known as the Lord Jesus Christ, Great Commission, found in Mark, chapter 16, verse 15, in which it is written, And he, the Lord Jesus Christ, said unto them, unto his apostles, Go ye into the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth that is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Once again, for the past few weeks or past few months, we have been going to Christ's great commission, that we could obey Christ's great commission in such a way that we fulfill verse 16 as well. That we would go into all the world and preach the gospel of every creature that souls might believe and be baptized to be saved. For Jesus Christ says once again in Matthew chapter 7 verse 20, Wherefore, by the fruits ye shall know them. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, says John chapter 15 verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Therefore we that are disciples of Jesus Christ, we desire to obey Christ's great commission in such a way that we bring forth fruit following the apostles' examples. And how do the apostles obey Christ's great commission? Mark chapter 16, verse 20. And they, the apostles, went forth. Why did they go forth? For Christ commanded them to go. To go where? To go ye into all the world. The Lord omnipotent reigneth. And what a perfect time that Christ gave to his apostles this great commission. Because at this time in the history of the world, Rome had conquered the world, the then known world, and made roads to all the outer regions of the world. And as Rome did this, and then the world entered into the Pax Romana, that is the Roman peace, which lasted for a few centuries, the apostles had the ability to fulfill Christ's great commission to go forth everywhere. And we can read in the history of the apostles from the early church, they went into the then known world. How many people today are ignorant of world history and not realizing the apostles went to China, not realizing the apostles went to India, not realize the Bible is already translated into the Chinese tongue and in some of the tongues of India back in the times of the apostles. And up into Europe and the far reaches of Africa, the apostles went forth everywhere because Christ commanded them to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. And when you read about the exploits of the apostles through church history, it's amazing the things the Lord did through them around the world. And throughout the history of the world, the influence of the apostles were still there, even in China. Remember the Mongolian leader Kublai Khan. And Kublai Khan, at the time the Mongolian kingdom was at its largest, after Genghis Khan's triumphant conquering of the world, and Kublai Khan tried to advance the kingdom. He failed miserably in the country of Vietnam, known at that time as Dai Viet. Nobody could conquer the Viet at that time. And he failed miserably in Japan because of what they called the divine wind. 
the kamikaze two different times, a typhoon destroyed the navy of the Mongolians. They could not conquer Japan, and they could not conquer Dai Viet, the Vietnamese. The Kublai Khan, his mother was a Christian. And we read throughout church and throughout history of the world how it, Christianity influenced the world. And because Kublai Khan's mother's a Christian, that's why it's open into the Mongolian kingdom's freedom of religion. As brutal as the Mongolians were and they conquered the world, and they were brutal indeed, they also gave the freedom of religion, and Christianity could flourish at that time as well, because the apostles, they went forth. Verse 20, and they went forth, and what did they do? And preached everywhere. Why did they preach for? Lifting up their voices like trumpets. Why did they do so, which cost them their lives? Because Christ only said to go ye into all the world. He commanded us to do something into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Once again, Christ did not command the apostles to go, and that was it. He commanded them to go and do something. And what was that something there to do? To go forth and preach to every creature. Therefore the apostles went forth and preached everywhere. No, not once a week on the Lord's Day in a church building. No, not two or three times a week for a Bible study. Christ commanded the apostles to preach to every creature. Therefore, no matter where the apostles went, they preached. Wherever it was, they went. They preached in season, out of season. How many today? They only preach at certain times. Maybe on the Lord's in the church building. Maybe there's certain set up spots where they preach and they go preach and then they leave. But that's not what the apostles did. They preached everywhere. In season, out of season. How many times I've come home for the preach and the gospel? And the testimonies I had was it where I preached the gospel. Yes, I went to certain places to preach the gospel, but I came with testimonies of the taxi drivers getting saved. The taxi drivers give me a ride back from preaching the gospel. Because not only did I preach in certain places, I preached on the way there and preached on the way back as well. Many years ago, a young American man joined me and preach in the gospel, and he preached with me for five years straight. And why did he join me of all people and preach the gospel with me for five years straight? Because the first time we met together, we're going to meet at a certain pier, because here in Bangkok, you can take the uh, boat taxis down the river, as most cities around the world are built near water sources. Bangkok is built next to the Chalpria River. And as we're meeting there at the pier to take a boat taxi down the Chapuya River to go preach the gospel of Sun Road, when they arrived to the pier, he witnessed me preaching to a European man, asking him, was he born again? And that's what caused that young American man to realize, I need what he's got. Yes, we're going to preach the gospel of Sun Road. And how many Christians, they do that. They have a designated spot they're going to preach. And they don't preach until they get there. Preach, they finish, and then they go home. But here this young American man saw me not just preaching on Kaosan Road, but on the way there. And the boat taxi on the way there. And the pier waiting for people. There at, when we eat at a restaurant, preaching the people at the tables next to us. There on Kaosan Road. If we stop to get a shake or a drink somewhere, a ice shake because it's very hot here, preaching to the workers, preaching to the people sitting next to us, and preaching the way back here as well. No matter where we go, we preach the gospel. I learned this back in 1995. I was told by a Christian who was older than me in the Lord. I was getting ready to come back to the United States of America, so it was 1996. I was just born again for a few months. And this person said, you know, you're leaving for America soon. You should get busy. Get out there preaching. I mean, this is a heathen land. You're going to be going to America soon. You should take advantage of being here. So I walked down the street. I passed the security guard of the building I was living at that time. Said hello to him. Walked past him. Somebody else, a motorbike tax driver, walked past him, walked past the person in the shop, walked past this person, walked past that person, and wondered where she could preach. And the Lord rebuked me. That's where you're supposed to preach to everyone. Not just a certain designated places, everyone. And that's what the apostles did. 
they went forth and preached everywhere. What does that mean? They preached everywhere. It wasn't certain designated spots they preached at, and that was it. Wherever the apostles were, there were they preaching. Whether it's going somewhere to eat, whether it's buying a drink somewhere, whether it's traveling somewhere, wherever the apostles went, that's where they preached. They went forth and preached everywhere. Why? Christ commanded us not to go, to go into the world, not only to preach and preach the gospel, he commanded us to preach the gospel to every creature, everyone. Last year, a team of missionaries came here to visit a certain church. This team of missionaries came from America. And I happened to be the one preaching that church at that for that Lord's Day. And after we finished preaching, we had some fellowship together. After the church service, the leader of that team of missionaries, who was the pastor of the group, he became very convicted. Why? I was just sharing some testimonies and talking about a time that I was flying from here to the United States of America. And because in the airplane I wasn't watching the television, I wasn't watching the movies or listening to the world in music. No, I was reading my Bible on the airplane. And while I was reading the Bible on the airplane, a man in his 40s, at that time I was in my 20s, a man in his 40s tapped me on the shoulder and said, Preacher man, can I sit up there next to you? I said, sure. Come on. The seat was empty right next to me. I was in the middle seats, the aisle seats, and I had him come sit next to me. That man had come here to Thailand, had gotten involved with a very evil woman, lost all his money, kicked him to the streets, and that man's own mother had to fly from America to come get him. His mother was very aged, maybe in her 70s, an older woman, and she had to fly here to rescue her son who was at the bottom, down and out. Lost everything, all of his life savings, all of his money, lost it to some Thai woman, as this is a land given over to whoredom, and there's many hearts here in this land, and they took all that man's money and left him for nothing. And his mother to pick him and take him back to America with nothing. And there he saw me reading the word of God. And because he saw me reading the word of God, he asked me to sit next to me and praise God by the word of God. I was reading, I was able to minister to this man and give hope to the hopeless once again. Praise the Lord. Sadly, and very convicted in the mission team last year, a few rows in front of me was a whole mission team. How you know their mission team? They all had their little missionary t-shirts on. A Thai flag, an American flag, and the, the theme of their mission was come out of the camp from the verse of, the verse of scripture in the book of Hebrews. And they had to come out from among them or come out of the camp and had a Thai flag and a, an American flag, the whole team of them. But on that airplane, they didn't miss it. to a man that needed help. Why? Because they already finished their mission. They're going home now. They're watching the movies, listening to the music, sleeping as much as they could, had their little pillows, enjoying their flight back home, and not preaching the word, in season, out of season. Yes, they came here on a mission, a mission, and they may have preached during their mission. I don't know what they did. I didn't know them. They had their little t-shirts. They did their little mission. But they didn't preach to every creature. And there on their airline back on the way back to their home was a man who needed help. And they couldn't help him because they weren't instant in season, out of season, to preach the word. We follow the apostles' examples. And the apostles, they went forth. And what did they do? They preached everywhere. And because of this, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Years ago, I preached in an area in Nakar and Lachasima, which is about four to five hours away from Bangkok. It was the far end of Nakar and Lachasima from Bangkok, which bordered near Chayapum. In fact, we're so close to Chayapum, they called it Chayapum. Reality, we're in Nakar and Lachasima. And there was a Vietnamese woman there and Praise God, bring up the Vietnamese quite often today. I don't know why, but there was a Vietnamese, Vietnamese woman living there, and she was upset at Christians. And they asked me, as I was having Vietnamese, to minister her. 
And so praise God, I went to see this Vietnamese woman. The Thai Christians couldn't handle her, but I could be, and I'm half Vietnamese, and because I'm half Vietnamese, I may look American on the outside, the inside, I'm pretty much full Vietnamese, so I could handle this woman. And why was she so upset at Christians? Because a few months prior, they had done an outreach there, and she watched them. They didn't realize she was watching them. Be careful of that quiet person. That quiet person sees everything. Be careful that person over there that's not saying much. They see everything. Be careful of the Viets. They're that quiet people that study everything, and they see everything. And this Vietnamese woman, she was watching this group, and they didn't realize it. And after they did their outreach and begged people from the stage to come and receive Jesus and pleaded with them to accept Christ and pray the sinner's prayer, when it was over with, they went to the shop down the street, ate, drank, and were merry. It didn't preach to anybody else. Not realizing this Vietnamese woman had followed them and was watching them. And she thought, if it's real, what they said on the stage, but you got to receive Jesus, and, and he's the only way to heaven. And if you don't receive Jesus, you'll go to hell. If it's so real, why were they preaching those people at that restaurant they're eating at? Why are they preaching to the person that served them or the people that cooked the food for them or the people on the restaurant for them? They were eating, drinking, being merry, just like everybody else. And that's why she had odd against Christians. They're fake. They're one way on the stage. They're one way when they're preaching, but they're quite another when they're outside of preaching. They're quite another at the restaurants. They're quite another when they're not on those stages pleading for people to pray the sinner's prayer. And that's the yacht she had against Christians because of their hypocrisy. They are not like the apostles. The apostles, they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following Amen. Why did they preach everywhere for? Because Christ commands us to preach the gospel to every creature. Not just the spot you choose to preach at. Every creature. Everybody you meet on the way there. And everybody you meet on the way back. Every creature. At the gas station. At the restaurants. At the grocery store. Every creature. Wherever there's people. You need to be preaching the gospel to them. In, sin, in season. Out of season. That's what the apostles did. What did they not do? Verse 20, And they went forth to preach everywhere that will work with them and confer the word signs falling. Amen. They did not build church buildings. For 300 years of church history, no church buildings were built. 300 years, close to 400 years, no church buildings were built. Today, we're seeing a judgment on the church as it is written, 1 Peter. 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come that judgment shall begin the house of God, if they first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? We know that the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, and nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens without the Lord in control. He reigneth. Everything that happens in this world, God is in control. And there is a judgment happening around the world amongst churches. They put such an emphasis on buildings and meeting in buildings and worshiping in buildings and spending all their money to build buildings and have fancy buildings and nice buildings and mega buildings on top of it. Today, communism has taken over the world. Now you understand what it's like in communist countries. They're in China when the churches go underground or again once again, I'm bringing up Vietnam again, I don't know why. In Vietnam, the church had to go underground. The church had to get up in a building, just like the early church, for three to four hundred years. Three to four centuries of no church buildings. The apostles, the examples that we follow, 
did not build one building. And the apostles in their epistles that are preserved here in God's word, there's not mention of any buildings. There's not mention of a building fund. There's not mention of raising up money to build buildings. In fact, we see the opposite. We see here in the early church of them selling their lands, selling their houses, their buildings, giving them away, and giving to the poor. Acts, in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 34. Neither was there um, any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the, brought the price of things that were sold, and laid them down the apostles' feet, and distributions were made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles said named Barnabas, which has been interpreted the son of a consolation, a Levite in the country of Cyprus, having land sold it, and brought the money, and laid it, at the apostles' feet. And what did they do with that money? They gave to every man according as he had need. We're going back to the root source of our faith. We're going back to the faith of the apostles. We're going back to the Christianity of the apostles. And the Christian of the apostles was, love thy neighbor as thyself. And if you have land or houses and there's hungry people around you, you're not loving thy neighbor as thyself. You can sell that and feed them as the apostles did. Once again, if we love thy neighbors thyself, there would be no need of capital there'd be no need of communism, and capitalism would completely fall apart. And today the world is in a fight over communism and capitalism. A world war going on today, an economic war. It's destroying countries. It's destroying people. An economic war of capitalism versus communism. And the answer is found. Love thy neighbor as thyself, not in word, but in deed and in truth. And how the apostles loved their neighbors themselves, everyone that had lands or houses sold them, brought the prices thereof, laid at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to every man according as he had need. They did not build buildings. They did not buy lands. They did the opposite. And by doing so back in these days, they lose their citizenship. They lose their right to vote because their vote back in the days of Rome, you had to be a landowner. If you didn't own a land, you were no longer even a citizen anymore with no rights. They gave up everything for the gospel's sake for their neighbor in need. That's how you love thy neighbor's self according to the word of God. And what did they not do? They didn't take people's money, buy land, and build church buildings for three to four centuries of church history. They did not take people's money, they did not buy lands, and they did not build church buildings. Why? We're returning to the example of the apostles, Acts chapter 17. What did the apostles preach and believe about God? At Acts chapter 17, beginning once again in verse 22, looking at the example of the Apostle Paul, fulfilling Christ's great commission to go into the world and preach the gospel of every creature. Here in Athens, Greece, a city that was wholly given to idolatry, it is written that Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive in all things are too superstitious. For as I passed by behind your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore we worship, him declare I unto you. We saw these past few evenings previous, as we've been studying God's word, that the Grecians or the Greeks, they had a many, quote unquote, lowercase g, gods they worship. The late Justin Martyr of the early church called them the devils of Genesis 6. When the Bible tells us the sons of God came down and took to them children of men. And they had offspring, half human, half angel beings. They became men of renown. And in Greek mythology, Justin Martyr believed was based on some truth. Some truth of what happened during the time before the flood. And those the Greeks were worshipping were those fallen angels, those devils, and their offspring, the men of renown. But yet, the Greeks knew 
though they had all these gods, lowercase g, they worshipped, they knew they're all sinners. They were fornicators. They had stories about their sins. Therefore, they knew there was a holy God up there somewhere. They didn't know who he was. There was an unknown God up there somewhere, not like the gods they worship or built idols to. In India, they have the same exact stories, just different names. Some historians believe that Alexander the Great brought his Greek gods to India. Or maybe those Indians had the same stories from the flood of Genesis. Maybe it's not a coincidence, both their stories, their epic, the Ramayana, and tied to call the Ramakian, it may be that their stories are the same because it comes from Genesis 6 as well. No matter how the Indians got those stories, they had the same lowercase g gods with the same stories, with the same stories of the, the sons of God coming down, taking themselves daughters of men, and having children became men of renown. And here in this country of Thailand, everything's based on the Ramayana, that epic, that what they call a mythology, which we believe is based on fact from Genesis chapter 6. And those false gods have spread all over Asia through the Ramayana and maybe from the Greeks. We don't have that as a fact, but maybe it's a coincidence, maybe it came with the same story, or maybe the Greeks brought it to India, one or the other, it's the same story. And we may mention a few evenings ago about how the Koreans of the Republic of Korea, South Korea, as they come here to be missionaries, they use a Korean name of one of their false gods. And that same false god that these Korean missionaries are using the Korean tongue comes from Indra of the Hindus or Zeus of the Greeks. Because Zeus and Indra are the same lowercase g god, just going by a different name. And the false god that the Koreans are worshipping is Indra of the Hindus or Zeus of the Greeks, the exact same statue, the exact same idol, the exact same God. But there is an unknown God out there, a God who is holy, not like those lowercase g gods, that the Greeks worship and knew existed, but didn't know where to find him. And the Apostle Paul says, Whom therefore ye English worship, him declare I unto you. Praise God. The apostle did not use Greek culture to try to win the Greeks to God. He didn't use the Greek gods or take one of the Greek gods and make him the God so the Greeks get saved. He didn't do such a thing. The apostle preached them the God of the Holy Bible. And once again, apart from God's word, you cannot know God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You can only have faith in God by hearing the word of God. Psalm 138, verse 2, For thou hast magnified the word above all of thy name. His word is above his name. Therefore, apart from his word, you cannot know God. Therefore, the apostle declared the unknown God to these men of Athens and strangers there in Mars Hill from the word of God, verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing these sort of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. One thing you need to know about the true God, the God of the Bible, he does not dwell in temples made with hands. If you want to know this God, the unknown God, the God of the Bible, you must know this first fact the apostle preached, he does not dwell in temples made with the hands of men. Once again, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing the sort of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Today, there's missionaries. That's their mission. Build church buildings. And here in Thailand, there are many empty church buildings around Thailand. Yes, the population is less than 1% Christian. But I can take you all over this country and show you empty church buildings that missionaries have built. Some of them have been converted even to boxing gyms. They're in Lopuri. 
One church had asked me to preach. I preached, and there's only a few people there on the Lord's Day. And because this church was a nice building with a nice parking lot, with all this land, that people who were running the church, nobody came to church, just five or six people on the Lord's Day, not even that much on the Lord's Day. And the people that came came from outside places, came with us. The church was basically empty. Monday through Saturday, they converted it into a boxing gym. There's empty churches all over this country. Churches that have no church members. They're in the Thai Burmese border. There's that one big concrete church buildings that some Korean missionaries put all that money into, built this concrete church building amongst the neighborhood of bamboo houses of poor villagers who are scavengers, foragers, living off the forest. And they built this concrete building, spent all that money, how a fortune it costs to build that building there. And only maybe five people show up on the Lord's Day. And on most Lord's Day, they don't even open. Nobody even shows up. Another empty church building. All over this country, there's empty church buildings right down the road from us. There's an empty church building. We just passed one a few days ago. It's now empty. It's got the Red Cross up, but it's empty now. Empty church buildings all over this country because that's what the missionaries did. They came here to build church buildings. They believed that was their mission. They raised up their missionary money and came to build buildings. And once the buildings was built and they did their job in a church building, they thought their mission was over and they retired off in the sunset, living their retired life. And these church buildings remain empty to this day, are converted to something completely else, like a boxing gym and one church building there in Lopri. Why is this? They don't know God. The God of the Holy Bible, first and foremost the Apostle preaches, he dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Whereas God, he's not in those places you make for him. He's not in those church buildings. He's not in those temples. He's not in those buildings you make for him. If you make a building and dedicate it to God, he isn't there, according to the Apostle Paul. Where is God? He's not in temples made with hands. If you dedicate a building to God, for God to dwell there, we're going to meet God every week. He's not there. He does not dwell in temples made with hands. Because if that becomes your doctrine, if that becomes your gospel to build places for God, you make hypocrites. Because if God dwells in a certain place, that means that that place you're going to act like something else. But outside that place, you act a certain way. And how many churchians, not Christians, churchians, we meet them on the Lord's Day at church buildings, they act like Christians. They talk like Christians. They speak like Christians. But as we go into the Lord preach God's every creature, and we see them out in the streets, a completely different person than there in those church buildings on the Lord's Day. Hypocrites. Fakes. They believe God is there. So when they go to that place, they act like something else. And then get to that building, they become holy they become a Christian. They act a certain way. They praise the Lord. They sing praises to God, that building. They praise God. Everybody else talk about the Lord. Speak like a Christian. And then leave that building back into the world and act like something else than what they acted like in that church building. Why is it that way? Because of a false teaching. A teaching that's contrary to the apostles' doctrine. The unknown God. The God who made the heaven and the earth does not dwell in temples made with hands. Therefore, we act the same 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We can worship God anywhere, here in our little room, outside, on the rooftop, on the streets, in the parks, even in jail. Serve the Lord, praying to God, and preaching the gospel as I've done before. We can serve the Lord anywhere. Why? God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Therefore, we serve Him 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no matter where we're at. And we're preaching the gospel to every creature in season, out of season, 
everywhere to everyone. Because God dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Years ago, the Lord led my wife and I to a church in Pattaya, Thailand, outside of Pattaya. They had built a nice church building with marble floors, had a dormitory next to the church building, and the person who owned that land was so happy to see us young people in our 20s at that time preaching the gospel in Pattaya that they invited us to stay there at the dormitory for free as we preached the gospel. So praise God, we were here by faith at the time, back in 1998, my wife and I. We had nowhere to stay, so praise God, we believe God opened the door for us. We had this place to stay at, and they promised to feed us as we stayed there preaching the gospel. Praise God. And as we're preaching the gospel, one of the places we preach at was on the railroad tracks. They're on the railroad tracks, it's owned by the government. And people, they call them squatters, they have nowhere to live. They just build homemade little shacks right on the railroad tracks, right next to the railroad tracks. They have nowhere else to live, they have no land. So they live off the government's land right next to the railroad tracks and hopes the government won't kick them off there. And with the breach of those, those shacks next to the railroad tracks, the people thought they were too unholy to go to a church building. The people thought they were too unclean and too poor and too dirty to go to a church building. But they said, can our children go there? They wanted their children to have a future. They wanted their children to go to a church building. They wanted their children to go to church, become Christians, and have a future. And as I was pleading with the adults, said, you could come too. And, and this, they didn't want, they didn't feel they were worthy. But they begged us if their children could come. So praise God on that following Lord's Day, all these children from the railroad tracks came. Children carrying children, all kinds of children, poor, barefoot, walking to church on the Lord's Day. And those people that own that church building, who made it so beautiful with marble floors and a nice painting of what they thought Jesus looked like and a big fancy cross and all the musical instruments so they could worship the Lord in this nice fancy building, when they saw these poor children coming with their dirty feet, they wouldn't allow them in the church building for fear that their dirty feet would make their marble floors dirty. And they rebuked me saying, I don't understand about this because I'm the one cleaning the floors. They wouldn't allow those children into that church building. What did those children grow up thinking? They grew up thinking they weren't worthy of God. They grew up thinking they're too dirty for God, just like their parents thought. And that's why so many here in this land are not Christians, because of this churchianity, this focus on these nice buildings. And the poor can't come to them. They don't allow the poor in there. They say they're too dirty. There's a dress code in church buildings. They don't allow the poor in the church buildings. And they're kicked out of the churches. And there's many poor people around this country here that want to believe in Jesus, want to become Christians, but they think they're not worthy. They think they're too unclean because of what they experience at these church buildings. And it's getting worse today. They're making their church buildings even fancier and bigger and nicer. And as they have social media where they want to have the nice videos, they've made the church building so fancy and nice with not only a dress code, you have to wear the same color shirt or the same costumes. Yes, in churches here in Thailand today, they're putting on costumes. They have dress up Sundays. These adults are playing little kids and the theme is Western, so they have to dress like cowboys. Another theme is biker Sunday. They have to dress like motorbike drivers. Churches that we know of that claim to believe in the Bible, that's what they're doing on Sundays. And the outsiders, they can't come in. They don't know the rules or the games they're playing. They fill outside. Church buildings is hindering the gospel. Christ's great commission is not to go into the world and build church buildings. Christ's great commission is to go into the world and preach to us every creature. And the apostles preached everywhere. And the apostle Paul preached that God had declared unto those in Athens, he did not dwell in temples made with hands. No, Christians, we can meet everywhere. And now today, the church buildings are being judged around the world. They're commanded not to meet in their church buildings. They're commanded not to pray in their church buildings. They're commanded not to sing in their church buildings because of this pandemic has gone around the world and our Lord God omnipotent reigneth. There's a reason this is happening so that Christians can get their focus off church buildings and put their focus back on God 
You don't have to go to church but to worship God. You don't have to go to church but to be a Christian. You can worship God anywhere and be a Christian anywhere and love thy neighbor as thyself works anywhere and in any situation. And if you can't do that without a church building, you don't know the God of the Bible. You have been deceived and are worshiping a false God. And if you think that Christ's great commission is to build church buildings and you want to put your money there in the church buildings and not into people and not love the neighbors and stuff and not helping those in need, you're going to stand before the Lord. He's going to say, depart. I never knew you cursed. Depart from me and to everlasting fire burn with the devil and his angels. For I was a hungry to give me no meat. No, Lord, I was building a church for you. I was a hungry to give me no meat. I was thirsty to give me no meat. No, Lord, I was putting my money into a church building. I was naked, he called me that. No, Lord, I was putting my money in the church buildings. I was sick and in prison, and you visited me not. God is judging the church. He's showing the church today it's not about a building. God dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Our focus needs to be on the Lord God, omnipotent, that reigneth. We need to focus on the Lord and loving thy neighbor as thyself and not investing in buildings and building a new roof and making a fancier building and putting these buildings up. We need to focus, as the apostles did, in souls. For God dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Once again, one of the greatest compliments I've received was back in the days when we were writing blogs before social media. And everybody was writing blogs back then. And back then, the expats here see me preach in the red light areas where write blogs about me. And they called me a Mormon missionary. And they thought I was the coolest Mormon they ever saw. One man wrote about it. Then I was preaching the gospel. He saw a man punch me. I took a few steps back, he said, and walked straight up and kept preaching the gospel. And he said, I was witnessing the coolest Mormon I had ever seen. And then the next blog, somebody cor corrected him and said, no, that brother Tony, he's not a Mormon. He's a Pentecostal. And they explained how he worked with the Pentecostal before. And he said, they're that way 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And all those bloggers writing on the thread there, thinking, what? Yeah, I know these kind of Christians. That brother Tony, he's that way you see him all the time. 24 hours a day, seven days. They couldn't believe that. What you mean he's, he's doing that all the time? Everywhere. That's how these people are. And praise God, I took that as a compliment. Yes. We are Christians and not churchians. God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Therefore, we worship God everywhere. God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Therefore, preach the gospel everywhere. God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Therefore, we love thy neighbor self everywhere. God does not dwell in temples made with hands. He is everywhere all the time and to be a christian and not a hypocrite you've got to live it 24 hours a day seven days a week and if you act a certain way in a church building then you act outside the church building you are what the bible calls a hypocrite and you do not know the lord and if your money and your focus and your time your energy is into a building and not in love with the neighbors yourself and not feed the hungry, not give them drink the thirsty, not clothe the naked, not visit those in prison, not visit those who are sick. If you're focused on buildings, you've got the wrong God. And you'll hear these words, depart from ye cursed and to everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. Let's focus on Christianity and not churchianity. Let's do as the apostles did, preach the gospel everywhere, not just in church buildings, everywhere to every creature, incident season, out of season, and not focus on building anything, but focus on souls, especially those in need, loving thy neighbor as thyself. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy word which endureth forever. Pray in those even sanctifies with thy truth, for thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.